Hey, everybody. Good morning. It's Friday. I don't know even what day it is, but it's time for another Daily Dose of Heart. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'm back from that little bit of bump in the road that I had you know, earlier this year. Um, I really appreciate all the support and all the well wishes that everybody sent me while I've taken care of my prostate cancer. I'm, I'm recovered remission, but I'm in, I'm in good shape and er everything's looking rosy and they've given me the go ahead to carry on. So that's what we're doing today. Um, so there's, there's been some things that I've been doing, even though I haven't been, you know, posting as much on social media and, sh and sharing things. We've still been growing here at the urban nano farm. Um, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to share some things that we've been doing, but but I want to encourage everybody to send your questions in here. Uh, we did a little promo earlier, trying to prime pump per se, and we had a lot of lot of response to that. So I'm going to go ahead and just talk about some things that I've been doing over the last couple months, and then we'll get to the questions because I know that they're going to be coming in. The first one I want to do is I want to promote um, the Daily Dose of Hort. That's the videos that my wife Katie and I do here at the Urban Nano Farm, sharing what we do here and, and, and really just showing people and home gardeners that I'm just a regular gardener just like everybody else. I try crazy things. I grow crazy stuff. I will tell you that this year I am growing 63 different varieties of peppers in, in, the, in the farm. Um, and when you think of 63 peppers, only three of those are bell pepper types. I'm growing a, a lot, really, of old genetics. I've gotten interested in trying to keep alive some of the old genetics, old varieties heirloom varieties of peppers that are that are out there in the uh, marketplace and i've really been concentrating on looking at varieties that were grown in mexico or the american southwest and i've been getting seed from a company a, an organization out in, in the southwest called native seed search and their goal is keeping old genetics of of peppers and vegetables and really arts and crafts alive and and available so if you want if you want to check out you know those folks it's native seed search.com or dot org i didn't write it down i'm sorry but but that but search that and you'll and you'll find that i'm also growing oh really i don't know nine or ten varieties of peppers that were selected in Eastern Europe, and particularly Ukraine, since that, that's in the news right now. And it, it's, it's very interesting, that area of the world, we've gotten a lot of our mahogany tomatoes from, from selection there, but there's also some very interesting peppers that are being grown there, and, I, and, and I'm growing them here. And I'll share what, what happens and how they taste and how they look. And we'll, 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 just, we'll just see what, what goes with that. Now, let's get, back, let, let's get back to the Daily Dose of Hort, those videos that, that Katie and I do. On Wednesday, we did our first Daily Dose of Hort after I've, I've, been, I've been feeling better. And we looked at the trellises where we've been growing pickles in the past couple of years. You know, cucumbers that we make into dill pickles because Katie and I do not like, you know, cucumbers. And one of the interesting um, varieties that, you know, a vegetable that we're growing back on those trellises is one that my daughter Ann gave me some seeds when we visited her in May. And it's called Chinese python bean or python melon, or python gourd. But this is kind of the size that, that you 
that you grow it to and harvest. And according to Baker's Creek, it tastes like green beans. We're, we're going to try this. This is about 18, 18 inches long, and I've got several of those out there. But the thing is with these Chinese python snake beans, you just got to, you know, it's called python snake bean. You got to think that something else is coming here. Well, take a look at this guy. I'm getting as far away from the camera as I can. This is over 36 inches long. And to tell you the truth, I've got a couple of them out there on my trellis that are pushing five feet long. I'm growing, I'm letting those grow that big because I'm, I'm going to collect seed. But this one, this, this one's about 36 inches long. And, oops, oops, sorry about that. I broke my beam. Anyways, we are going to be cooking that as a, I got to pick up here. That's what you get for doing live video. So that big bean that I showed you, this is what it looks like now. Anyways, we're going to be cooking this up in, in a couple of, recipes that my wife Katie has come up with and we'll, we'll t tell you how that all how that all tastes uh, I'm all flustered by breaking my big um, python snake bean uh, with with that what else do I want to talk about oh here's something that I shared earlier this year about some doing some plant propagation of ZZ plant that's that plant that really easy to care for house plant that you really, you really can't, you know, you really can't kill. But we were doing some things with some propagation of these by taking leaf cuttings or collecting leaves and propagating. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you this. I gotta see this. There, there's a, there's a leaf cutting that I took of that. And look at the little shoot that's coming off. So this is something that we, we can go ahead and propagate pretty easily. I've done a daily dose on this. I'll have to go back and look at it. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll share that. But if anybody has any questions about ZZ plant, we can, we can talk about that. Oh, my gosh. I'm just looking up here and, you know, or looking, looking down here at all the comments that are coming in. I appreciate everybody. And, you know, here we got Ann. Hey, thanks for watching. Vicky's there. Alan, my good friend, thanks for joining in. But we have a question from Julie Deanne Cullinan. When is it safe to redo my landscape plants? We've removed overgrown boxwoods, which, let me just tell you, that's a good thing. And want to put in some more color. Well, if you want to redo the landscape, you can really do that any time when, you cho when you're choosing containerized plants. And my, my suggestions would be kind of get an idea of what you want and then go to your local independent garden center and, and tell them what you're looking for. Okay, your ideas and ask, what do you got? And maybe more importantly, what can you get for me? The, the independents can source plants for your landscape. You know, if you go to the box stores, they're not, you know, if you've got kind of an idea that I want a certain type of plant and they don't have it, they are not going to search it out and source it for you. Because you go to the box stores, there's a buyer in a windowless office someplace in a big city buying plants for 150 different big box stores and they just show up they put them out that's what you get but go to your local independents and they can help you be successful in picking plants that that you want so that that's what I, that's what i would say julie go ahead and do that if you want more advice and this is really for everybody you can send me an email 
at Southern Gardening at msstate.edu, and I can I we and we can and we can chat directly uh, about something like that. Okay, so Rhonda Dent, first year in a long time, but hornworms almost took out my entire tomato plants this year. Any prevention uh, suggestions for hornworms? I tried to be watching, but it happened so quickly. I grow in earth boxes. Well, listen, Rhonda, that, that, you know, that's, you know, I, I really feel you because, you know, I am an earth box grower. And I, and I'll tell you from a perspective of the um, tomato hornworms, I can tell you what we have done that has been very successful. Here at the Urban Nano Farm, the first year, which was 2008, that we were growing tomatoes, the birds pecked holes in every single tomato. And, and they didn't eat the tomatoes. They just pecked holes, pecked a hole here, pecked a hole in the next one, and continued down the road. Then the fruit flies set in and the other bugs, you know, and, and we didn't get any tomatoes. So we've gone ahead and basically made a, a screen tomato patch where we've taken pond netting and covered the entire tomato patch here at the Urban Nano Farm. And what that has done is, well, stop the birds for one thing, but we don't get any tomato hornworms because the moths, which are flying at night and getting into the tomatoes and laying eggs, they can't get to the tomato plants. The only times that we do get hornworms in, in, the, in the tomatoes can be from when I have tomato plants that are out of my propagation bench, which I, which I don't cover, and, and, we, and we just transplant them in there. Or when the netting, if we get some weather, and, and we'll, we'll blow the netting off a little bit. And all it takes is like one day or two days, and those moths get in there. We did a uh, daily dose last year of looking for uh, tomato hornworms at night using the UV light. Now, this is a really cool way to detect them of getting a UV light flashlight going out at night and the caterpillars fluoresce and they shine like a beacon. Well, we had just had a storm come through and my netting was blown off for three days. And I fixed it all, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, we were out there with the UV light and we found all these hornworms. They were all the same size, which means those moths had gotten in there and laid the, and laid the eggs. Um, you could also try, you know, if you don't want to go as crazy as exclusion like, like I have done, you can use products like BT or Stenosid and kind of do kind of a calendar spray. I really don't like that. Um, ju just because we have other insects in there and spinosa can, um, can impact those. But if, if you want some other ideas, you know, go ahead, send me an email, Rhonda, and, and we can, and we can, we, we can talk about that. Now, Sylvia has asked, asked the question, is it too late to start tomatoes for fall? No. Now, Sylvia, I don't know where you live, um, here on the coast. The um, daily dose of port, of port that we did that we shot yesterday was about transplanting seedling tomatoes into bigger pots to go out this fall. Um, if if you haven't done that yet, you, if you're going to start your own seeds, you need about six weeks from sowing the seeds to when they actually can go out outside. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't direct seed the uh, the tomatoes. Uh, you know, if, if you haven't sown seeds yet, you know, maybe your best bet is go to your local independent garden center, buy some tomato transplants, and get those in the garden. I always shoot for the fall crop mid-August. It's, it's just kind of, it's just kind of a, a date that I look at, you know, August 10th, August 15th. Um, I really kind of look at my anniversary, my anniversary our anniversary, sorry, Kate, I know you're watching, uh, which is August 8th. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for any congratulations, but hey, Southern Gardening Nation, if you want to send some congrats to um, for our anniversary on August 8th, I'm not going to complain, okay? 
but that, that's that's kind of kind of the way the way I would I would look at it. Now, Ann Barnes is asking about suggestions of what to plant for a small garden in South Mississippi. Oh my gosh, you you've got lots of lots of options. Um, if if you haven't done your tomatoes, don't worry. You know, if you go like mid August, you can go ahead and start seeding kale, collards, Swiss chard, you know. Broccoli, broccoli, cauliflower. I may wait till September 1st, mid-September to do that. Um, but but there's lots of options for the cool season crops. Definitely you're gonna look at radishes, you know, check out what what I've been doing with the Long Beach red radish. You know, carrots are, are always a good a good solution. But if you want some more suggestions, I suggest you take a look at the latest version of our Mississippi Vegetable Gardener's Guide, which is the replacement for, you know, that classic garden tabloid. And there's lots of varieties, suggestions, planting times that, that, you, that, you, can, uh, that you can find in there. And, you want, hey, send me an email. I'll send, I'll send you a link to get that, okay? You know, and that's southerngardening at msstate.edu. Okay, so Sherry Haver. Hi, I bought some salvia. Uh, one plant bloomed, three didn't. They're healthy, but no flowers. I don't know. Send me some pictures. Send me that as a question on, on email, Sherry, and I'll, 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 I'll dig, I'll dig around. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, just to tell you the truth. And Rhonda says, thanks. Karen Ladner, I have healthy bell peppers, the purple ones, but they, okay, where we go here, but they won't grow very big are small at maturity. What, what would that be? Um, that's a tough one. Uh, Karen, I, I, I have seen some of my bell peppers, which are advertised as kind of being, you know, you know, like a big bell pepper, not fully, if you want to say, grow out to the size I, I thought. I, I've seen that a lot with the purple ones, with the ones, there, there's one that's called Bianca, which is kind of a white, a white bell pepper. Um, I, 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 I really don't know. It could be a fertilization issue. It could be a, a water issue. I, I don't know. If you want to send me some pictures? I'll, t I'll take a look at them. You know, I, I think that's the best I can do right now. Now, Lynn Baines says, what type of carrots do you prefer? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, Lynn, I like to grow the, the colorful the carrots. You know, be it the purple ones or the yellow ones, that there's red carrots out there. It, it's really interesting about carrots because all of the old genetics, carrots were all these different colors. And at some point, the consumer decided that orange was the color that people, that, that people preferred. And, and so the growers, of course, because they want to sell carrots, will grow the carrots that people want. And so kind of that whole growing strategy of varieties of carrots all shifted to orange. What, you know, who, who, knows, who knows why, but, but it was strictly consumer preference. If you go to a, you know, a site like um, Baker's Creek, or some of these other heirloom, heirloom sources, or Johnny Seeds. There are carrot selections that are all the colors of the rainbow, and they are gorgeous. And do I think that they taste any different than the orange? Yeah, to me, no. But the fact is that we eat with our eyes first, and I like to see a variety of color. Uh, on our on our dinner, on our dinner plates, so I, I would suggest go ahead, go look at the catalogs, and find some of these carrots 
that are not orange and 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 try and try them out. I know Ferry Morse. Um, last year, I grew a mixed color selection from Ferry Morse, and there were now there were oranges there, but there were yellows, there were white carrots, and there were some red carrots mixed into it, and it just it just made dinner a, l- a little fun by having all the, all those all those different colors. So that that's what that's what I suggest. Well, see what the catalogs have. And, and, and grow, grow some different colored carrots in, in your garden this year. Hey, Meg, how you doing? My tomato leaves are getting brown spots all over, turning yellow and eventually falling off. I'm not going to have any tomatoes left pretty soon. What's wrong? Oh, my gosh, Meg. Here in the, in the southeast, our tomato plants will get every leaf de- leaf disease known to mankind on them and it's it's hard it's hard to keep up with that disease pressure and i made the decision several years ago in fact i wrote about that this week in my southern gardening column about my tomato tips and basically i have stopped spraying fungicides in my tomatoes there's a couple of couple of reasons for that um you know here on the gulf coast which may be a little different than than where when where everybody's at uh, we have two tomato seasons you know plant tomatoes end of march early april and then i pull the plants on fourth of july one reason for that is it's too hot the f- flowers you know they bloom like crazy, but the pollen aborts in the hot temperatures, and so you don't make tomatoes. And it's my opinion that if a plant is going to be growing in my yard, it's, it's got to pull its own weight. And I am not going to take care of tomato plants for two months, July and August, if they're not going to produce tomatoes. So I pull the plants. I've started new plants, which was... You know, we showed the, uh, the daily dose support yesterday, me transplanting my seedlings, getting them ready to go out next month. And then we're growing the tomatoes in the fall, temperatures are moderating, and, we, and we'll get tomatoes all the way up to the first hard frost. We've had tomatoes on the vine Christmas Day here. So th- that's, that's the strategy that, that I use. Um, <laughs> You know, and it comes down to the question, Meg, of whether you want nice looking plants or you want tomatoes. And and I have found that even though some of my tomato plants have just looked awful and leaves falling off and, you know, and the like, but they still produce tomatoes. The, those tomato fruit that, that have already started they continue and, and they'll go ahead and write them for you. And you, you can go ahead with that. But I mean, that's that's my suggestion. I'm not saying go out and start spraying fungicides. I think that's a, a losing battle. I, I think you, I think you have to take a look at, you know, cost benefit. Is it worth my time? Is it worth the product? I don't think it is. If you want more tips on that, Meg, email me. I'll, I'll give you some more. Southern Gardening at msstate.edu. Okay, let's see here. What what do we have? God, we got a lot of lot lot of lot of comments here. Well, let's see here. James, I'm looking to over overwinter some pepper plants this year. Do you have any specific advice? Can bell peppers produce indoors while being overwintered? You know, James, that's a really good question. Um, in, in my opinion, no. It's, it's all going to come down to light and temperature. And, and I think primarily if you're talking about bringing plants indoors, I, I'm thinking like, like room temperature. But I don't think that you're going to be able to supply the amount of light that they need to produce. You, I think you can keep them alive until, until next year. But, but I, I, I doubt that they're going to be very productive unless you get into the, one of these really crazy indoor growing situations with some high intensity LEDs so the plants get get enough energy. 
Um, I have overwintered some of my uh, my uh, super hot tomato plants. And one of the things I did, and this was a tip I got on the internet of all places. Um, the fall of the year, I took those pepper plants and I chopped them off about four inches from, four inches from, from the soil line, knocked most of the, uh, the uh, potting mix off the roots, and I, I kept them out on my back porch. And basically, I didn't touch them until we got around to like February. And once we got to February, I kind of cleaned them all off. I repotted them, and and they start and they started growing the next year. To me, that's a lot of work, and I want to make gardening easy. I've got other other better things to do than trying to keep a couple of pepper plants alive. But you can do it. I mean, I'm just talking about my situation and how I garden. So that that's that's what that's what I would do if you want if you want to try it. You you could go you could go ahead and do it and yeah hey and see and see what happens. Let's see what else we got here. So Donnie Hale, I have three green bell pepper plants that are growing be growing better plants than I have ever had, but still no blooms. Planted late April. Any ideas why they are not blooming even though they are growing good? Um, Donnie, I th I think you get into this classic. Um, situation where folks may suggest that you've over fertilized them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that that happens in a home situation, but I will tell you this. My experience is that peppers produce better after 4th of July. And I did a, I did an experiment last year because I was running out of time to doing, to do things that I, took all my pepper plants and I chopped them back in half and let, the, let them regrow the growth. And we had a very good pepper harvest once we got into September, October. Um, you know, it was that kind of a one-time thing, cutting the plants back. I, I don't know. It did work. I'm considering doing that a little with some of the plants this year just, just to see how it works. It may be something something to think about. Um, you want to send me some pictures of the plants, where they're growing, kind of in the conditions they're in. I'll I'll take I'll take a look at that and give you give you an idea. Okay, and James says mentioned the overwintered peppers will be in a root root vegetable earth box. Um, I'm not sure that that makes a difference in my in my answer, James. Um, you want to go ahead and make sure you try to give the, give them enough light that they're that they're in a bright window, maybe even with an LED light over the top of them, you know, and, and see what happens. And even if they don't produce peppers over the winter time, boom, you put them outside, you know, end of March, beginning of April, but you're you're, you're like three months ahead of the game, maybe. So I, I would I would do that. Um. So so Meg says. So should, should I plant tomatoes in that same spot? You know, Meg was having some problems with the tomato leaves falling off and, look, and looking ugly. Um, here's the question, Meg. Are they in ground or are they in a container with peat-based potting mix? If they're in ground with native soil, planting tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes repeatedly builds up pathogen populations, a fusarium, verticillium, and then you'll have the bacterial wilt pop up. That, that's why um, crops are rotated, so, so that bacterium doesn't, doesn't build up. If you're growing in a pot or an earth box with professional peat-based growing mix, totally different story. Um, here at the Urban Nano Farm, we have been growing tomatoes in the same earth boxes in professional potting mix, two tomato crops a year since 2009. So what is that? 12 years? So that means 24, to, 24 tomato crops, zero bacterial wilt situation because that peat-based potting mix is really antagonistic to those, to those bacteria. Now, I don't add compost. 
which adds another vector for, for the bacteria. I use strictly peat-based potting mix. And we have had no instances of bacterial wilt in 13 years. So that's, that's all I can say. It depends on your growing situation in ground, in pots, what you're growing in is, is, what, is what, what you have to look at. And so Rhonda, hey, Rhonda, thank you for supporting my thoughts here. Totally agree with your theory on tomato plants pulling in July, even in central Mississippi. Absolutely. Even central Mississippi, I think, gets too hot. And you, you, if you wisely choose some earlier tomatoes for the fall, you can have that fall tomato crop. Uh, and I'll tell you, if anybody's interested in my choice of tomatoes that I grow for the fall season, send me that email to msstate.ed, uh, southerngardeningmsstate.ed, and, and, I'll sh and I'll share that with you. Some of them, hey, you're going to have to get the seeds and, tr and, try, and try them yourself. So we, we can go ahead and do that. So, so Jane says, can I cut my fig, fig tree limbs back? My tree is 15 foot tall and a good producer, but the birds get most of the fruit. I need help. Yeah, you, you can go ahead and prune, and prune your, your figs back and kind of keep them in a more manageable, manageable size. You also might want to consider putting bird netting out on that just to keep those, those pesky birds out of your figs. Okay, so Meg, okay, back. I'm growing corn for the first time, half in grow buckets and half in the ground. The ones in the ground, they're doing great, while the ones in the grow buckets are dying. Two different kinds. Oh, good, good question. Um, it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it will depend on what the potting mix is in your, in your grow buckets. Um, I've had good success growing corn in my earth boxes with professional potting mix. Um, that may that may be this that may be the situation. Um, send me some more information. Let let me let me think about that a little bit, and maybe give maybe give you a, a better a better answer. Okay, let's see here. So, Vicky, we tried emphasis on tried to grow corn for the first time this year. Only grew to around four four to five feet tall. Very small ears. Can you help us? Vicki, a lot of times, and, and what, what I've noticed with growing corn, and, and this is it in my, uh, my earth boxes, is it's crucial to keep a consistent moisture content and nutrition. Um, corn, as they start to get up and start to produce ears, are really heavy feeders. And so you've got to have enough nutrients there in the, you know, in the, in the soil available for the corn plants to um, to access you know it, it could be a variety situation that that I, that I don't that I don't know but that that's kind of kind of my thoughts on that you, you may get some some more information in that Mississippi vegetable growers guide send me an email I'll send you a link to that and and we and we can go from there oh my gosh we have run out of, out of questions already so let, let me go ahead, and, and I've got some other things that I, that I wanted, to, um, wanted to talk about. I had somebody ask me, and I'm, go, I'm, going, to sh I'm going to show this, and if you see particles flying off this tray, because I have a fan over here because it is hot and humid on the back porch, and I'm trying to stay cool. I had some, uh, somebody send me a question about a product called pit moss and pit moss is a recycled paper wood fiber material that was actually I, and i think what what's the um what what's the show where pe where people um pitch their ideas looking for funding i i can't remember it because I, I don't watch it but pit moss is this product and it's recycled paper wood products that is being touted as a peat substitute. And, uh, and I've got right here, right next to it, this is the Jolly Gardener professional growing mix, the, the mix that I really like. Well, 
I got I got some of this pit moss to try, and and I'm going to run it through some some different trials because, you know, one one of our home gardeners here in Mississippi asked the question, so so I I got some from the company, and my my initial trials, and I was growing some peppers, um, where where I germinated the pepper seed in my Jolly Gardener peat mix and the uh, pit moss peat substitute mix. Uh, and they, they have been out in my, uh, in my mist bed. They've been treated, treated the same, fertilized the same. And I, I'm just going to show you, this is the pepper that was grown in the, in the Jolly Gardener peat mix. This is the pepper, same age, that's grown in the peat substitute. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying, look, this this is results I have. I'm going to try some different things. I'm going to I'm going to try mixing the pit moss in with some other mix, and see what happens. But this is, you know, I I do trialing here at the Urban Nano Farm, look at, looking for ways to be a better grower, even a more responsible grower. Let's see what what else do we have here? Do we get any other questions? Okay, so Vicky, I, I grew tomatoes in buckets using backhoe soil. Can I re when can I reuse the soil for other plants? Great question, Vicky. Now I'm assuming the backhoe soil is a peat mix, um, and if and if that's the case, of course you you can use reuse that that mix for other plants. Uh, I, I use, you know, and I've talked about the professional growing mix here. I, re, I reuse this mix, mix for everything. Um, you know, I'll put it back in tomato pots. I'll put it, you know, in, in, in other containers. I don't put it back. I don't put it out in the soil. I think it's too valuable that, that you can still use it in a container garden rather than, recycling it in the compost pile and the like. But, but you could do that if you wanted. But yes, go ahead, reuse it. It's valuable and you'll, you'll get you'll get great you'll get great results with that. Let's see. No more questions. So here it's a perfect time for me to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion here. Uh, I, I have been promoting my my book Southern Gardening all year long. You know, er, ever since it was um, published in February of this year, it's it's a book that we have looked at a lot of the the um, written products that I've done for the um, Southern Gardening column. We've updated information, updated pictures, and and this is really a, a piece of work that was twelve years in the making, and we're really proud of it. It is it is it is gorgeous. The pick the pictures, and and I, and I will I will I will say let's let me let me let me let me get let me get to some really pretty pictures here. Yeah, all all the all of the pictures I that are in the book I I have taken myself. It's great advice. It's a book that actually is a good idea book, not only for Mississippi, but for the entire Southeast down into Florida and my good friend, Ron Wilson up in Cincinnati with who hosts the uh, radio show in the garden with Ron Wilson. He loves it. Um, even though we're talking about plants in Mississippi, these are all plants that be, that can be grown in the summer all over the country. We've got great advice here. You can go to the, the publisher and get this. That's university press of Mississippi and order from them. If you want a signed copy, you can go ahead, um, you know, DM me. I will send you the um, the um, the information. It's twenty five dollars. If you want a signed copy, add two dollars for shipping. I split the shipping with you. So, with that, we'll uh, see what else we have here. Okay, so we've got, hey, hey, Robin, how you doing? Mexican petunias. I never planted these in my prayer garden, yet they are everywhere. How do I get rid of them? 
Mexican petunias are tough. They, they are, let's, let's just say they are aggressive. Uh, they, they will, they, they will spread by rhizomes. They'll spread by seed. There, there are some good selections coming out of the University of Florida, which are sterile. So, so they're not reproducing by seeds, but they still produce by the rhizomes. The only way you can do that is if you want, you know, you could dig the rhizomes up, but you're not going to get rid of them all. You know, when they pop up, I would, I would take your pruners. And, and of course, I like my coronas. And I would chop the stems off and I would treat the stems with Roundup or a, a, a brush herbicide and do that because you have to get into the root system and eliminate that, that root system. So that, that's, that's what you're going to have to do. It's probably going to be a multi-year project for you. So something to look forward to, right? Okay, so let's see here. And Rob, Rob, Robin says, oh, thank you. Great book. Glad that your health is better. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Vicki, thanks for being back. Vivian, with bamboo being very invasive, very invasive plant, is there anything... I can do when my neighbor wants to plant it along our joint property line. Here's another situation where if you have that plant popping up on your side, I chop it off and I would, I would treat that cut in. Um, that, that's, that's what, that's what I would do. So and you do roundup or a, you know, brush or vine, vine herbicide, but don't spray it. Actually take like a paintbrush, cut it, paint that in and if again this is going to be a project for you and and becky love my book and happy i'm back hey thank you becky appreciate that vicky has my fig tree has a fungus on the trunk of the tree what should i do okay now is it a fungus on the tree vicky or is it lichen um uh, because a, a lot of lot of questions i get about fungus on the on the um trunks of trees are actually lichen, which is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. And all they're doing is using the trunk of that tree for support. They're not doing anything to the tree. The, al the algae is photosynthesizing. The fungi is holding it on and gathering water from the atmosphere. What, what you really need to do, send me a picture of that, okay? Just, just so I can be sure. Because I'm assuming that you're talking about lichen. It could, it could be something else. But send a picture, a good, a good, pic, good quality picture to southerngardening at msstate.edu. And I'll, I'll take a look at it and give, give you some advice on that. Okay, now, boy, the questions just keep coming. Lee, I had a tomato plant this year that never bloomed. Any ideas what's going on? Boy, I, I don't know, Lee. It could be a light situation. It could be a water situation. Again, if, if you still got it in the ground, send me a picture. Um, if, you want, if you want to contact your county extension office up there, that they, they, can help, they can help you too. But this is something that kind, kind of got to get some, some eyeballs on that. Okay, so Dean, haven't heard from Dean in a while. How often do you do a soil test and adjustment of pH nutrients in your boxes? Oh, here's a great question. Um, if you're gardening in ground, I recommend doing soil testing at least every couple of years. Contact your local county extension office. We'll take, take care of that. Best $8 you'll ever spend. Now, He's asking about pH adjustment and nutrients in the earth boxes. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, Dean. And I don't soil test my earth boxes. The peat-based potting mix does not have a great deal of cation exchange capacity, so it's not holding on to nutrients. It also tends to push the pH of your box down a little bit. And so what I do every time I replant, I add, if it's tomatoes, I add two cups of pelletized dolomite, 
and I add the fertilizer strip, generally one cup of a 555 or 10, 10, 10 laid on top of the mix. And we put the cover on it and we're, and we're good to go. We, we don't really see any long-term effects of higher pH in the earth boxes. It's, ge it's generally a lower pH. So we add the dolomite every time we plant and don't, don't have a problem with that. Okay, so, so Elaine, I have what I think is ginger, and all the leaves keep getting brown on the edges. Um, it, brown on the edges could be a, it, could, that probably environmental. It could be that they're drying out. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just guessing here, Elaine, but that's generally the, the kind, of, kind of response that, that we'll see out of a plant that's not getting enough water. Um, and, and it's just getting getting too hot. Send me some pictures. We'll take a look at it. And Lee, uh, Lee's pulled his plant up. Never seen it before. Hey, if you see it again, send me some pictures, okay? So I'm going to tell you with that, we're at 46 minutes. It's starting to get warm here on the back porch. So I am, I am going to uh, go ahead you know, and call it a day you know i think it's time for a door prize and i'm i'm not i'm not quite sure how i'm going to do it i thought about just doing a random number um you know of 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 comments uh maybe it's and i think i may have asked this uh, in the past but send it send and put in your comments. Okay, it's got to be in the comments for this. Pictures. I'm, you know, I, I understand it's gonna gonna be gonna be a little little tough with this, but send me pictures of your best tomato plant. And what I'll do is I'll I'll go through these over the weekend, and who I choose will get a collection of the micro tomatoes, the little itty bitty dwarf tomatoes that I've been growing here at the Urban Nano Farm. I've been saving seed. I'll send you a collection of those. How, how does that sound? I, I need somebody to give me a thumbs up on that or a yes, that sounds good, Gary. And we, we, will, we, will, go, we will go from there. So if there's, no, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna say adios. I'm glad to be back. You're gonna, gonna see more, more, more of me out here on social media. Watch the um, daily doses of port that that we're doing um i think kate does a fantastic job on the camera for me and uh, we got some thumbs up okay very very good we're, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and go, gonna, gonna go ahead and do that and listen go ahead share this with all your friends i want to try and grow southern garden nation i'm also going to be doing some promotion of the videos that we do primarily the daily doses on the Heritage Cottage Urban Nano Farm YouTube channel. Look for look for more um, details on that, but but share that. Yeah, thanks thanks everybody. Appreciate all the good thoughts, and and we'll see you next month for another Ask Me Anything. See you guys.